Welcome to the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. I'm Sissy Goff. I'm David Thomas. And I'm Melissa Trevathan. And we're so glad you've set aside a few minutes to spend with us today. In each episode of this podcast, we'll share some of what we're learning in the work we do with kids and families on a daily basis at Daystar Counseling in Nashville, Tennessee. Our goal is to help you care for the kids in your life with a little more understanding, a little more practical help, and a whole lot of hope. So pull up a chair and join us on this journey from our little yellow house to yours. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow provides meaningful screen time and shared experiences for families to help you grow in your faith together. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.gominnow.com. We are so humbled and honored to share this conversation with you. When we recorded it last week, we didn't plan on it airing until next season in the fall, but this conversation feels so important and so timely that we wanted to share it with you now. Dr. Chimway Williams is a board-certified and licensed professional counselor in the state of Georgia. She has served as a school counselor, counselor supervisor, and an executive coach. Her expertise lies in the areas of trauma recovery, enhancing resilience, and adolescent and young adult wellness. She's taught at Georgia State University, University of Central Florida, and Rollins College. Dr. Chimway currently speaks and writes in the areas of stress and anxiety management and wellness. She maintains an active private practice in Roswell, Georgia, serving individuals, couples, adolescents, and young adults. Her website is MeaningfulSolutionsCounseling.com, and we can't wait for y'all to meet her. So it was... Probably what now, a year and a half ago when the pandemic had just gotten started, that we were going to be speaking in an event. And we were told that we needed to have a conversation with someone before we ever did it so that we could be like minded in our approach about kids and teenagers. And we had no idea when they said, Chinway Williams is going to be talking about the teenagers while y'all are talking about the kids. We want you to connect. We had no idea this friendship that would have been sparked through that. And this, gosh, the admiration we have for you, Tim Way, I mean, just is through the roof. We're so grateful for your voice. I feel like we use your voice a lot and say, will you speak to our folks? And just like the truth that you share in such a gracious way, the mental health that you advocate for, the hope that you bring to the world is just a game changer. And so I think every time we get to partner with you on anything, we are delighted in every way. And so it's especially fun for us to get to have you on the Raising Boys and Girls podcast today. It really is. I was even thinking when the event planners for that said to us, we think you're really going to be like-minded automatically. And we were like, oh my goodness, like-minded, like-hearted. We want to be best friends with you. Will you move to Nashville? It just spun (laughs) out from there, didn't it? Okay, and you know what that just made me remember? So I don't know if you remember this, Chinway, but I was turning 50 maybe a month after we talked, and you said, girl, you need to have a virtual (laughs) dance party. And I I mean, immediately I thought, I love her. We're going to be great friends. (laughs) There have been so many different points of connection, right? Yes. yes. I just love you guys, and I just feel so honored to be a part of anything that you guys are doing. And we have been connected in different ways through North Point, the Parent Summit, and Orange, and now this. And so I'm so grateful. Thank you for asking me to join you today. Oh, it's our honor to have you be it a part of this time. Is. And to even begin by asking you the question of what do you think is different in this world? in this time right now for kids and families? In the work that I do, so I have a practice, as the two of you know, in Roswell, Georgia, which is right outside of Atlanta. And I see individuals, I see families. I was a former high school counselor, so I have a lot of high schoolers on my caseload. And my high schoolers are now in college. I have young adult professionals. And I think across the board, things just have ramped up. And I think the low-hanging fruit, of course, is technology. So that's what many people point to. And I think that that's made a huge difference in our lives, good and not so good. And I think just in the past year related to technology, I think people are 
stressed. And you would think that, especially in the beginning part of the pandemic, you know, we're slowing down. So many of us are in lockdown. So many of us are doing remote schooling, remote learning, not everybody across the board, across the nation, but many of us were at some point And you would think that there would be a sense of calm. And I think for some kids, and Sissy and David, I'm sure you've seen this too, especially with those who have high anxiety in the beginning, it sort of felt great for them. And people were like, yay, like now you understand where I've been all this time. But soon thereafter, most of the folks on my caseload really experienced um, heightened anxiety because of everything just being so different so uncertain, so unfamiliar. And of course, we know that that breeds more and more anxiety. So that's sort of like in general, what I've noticed in the past year. I think in addition to that, what feels different in modern times is probably due to technology, but that's certainly not the only reason. I think there's less compassion Mm. I believe in my heart that there's less empathy and compassion and empathy aren't the same thing. I think in order to have compassion, you have to have empathy. And with the lack of connection, that face-to-face connection with this past year, but even prior to that, I feel like that's been the biggest difference is that we're living busy lives like pedal to the metal we're go, go, go. It's like a rat race for the parents and for us and for the kids with all of their extracurriculars and their expectations and, you know, just all the obligations. And then being able to see other people doing different things, you know, via social media, I think that that increases the pressure that kids and adults alike face. So that's what I think is happening. There is the pressure cooker, because of all the modern things that we have going on. And in addition to that, especially this past year with the stress that we've been under, there's been, I think, a lack of compassion and empathy. Mm. Yes. So agree with that. And I love how you combined those two and said they play into each other. And that may pertain to what you would say. So if you had to go back to kind of a vintage value that you really want kids to get these days, to go back to, what would you say it would be? Yeah, it's related to empathy and compassion, and I would say kindness, and Mm. rolled into that respect. Mm. And I think just related to what we just talked about, I think with the anonymity that's associated with you know, technology and and even the good aspects of it. And I, Sissy, you and I share this. David, I don't see you much on Instagram. (laughs) I I do, but not necessarily posting directly. I do see your handsome face. (laughs) But um, I see Sissy and Lucy all the time. You have figured that out. Yes, yes. (laughs) That's good. So there are good things about technology. There are great things about social media. And we're able to reach people across the globe. We're able to stay more connected. We're able to highlight what I love is mental health. I'm I'm a mental health advocate. And so I want people to get connected to the support and resources that are available to them. So we're chipping away at that stigma. So I think social media allows for that. But David, you could probably speak to this more than Sissy and I, there are drawbacks to that. I think we continue to kind of stay ramped up. We're kind of, you know, checking the notifications. And and sometimes for me, it takes me forever to post. And so that's time that I could be doing other things. And But I'm an adult woman, a wife, a mother with a fully developed frontal lobe. (laughs) And so (laughs) it's hard for me. And so I know it's going to be really challenging for our kiddos and for our young adults who don't have like fully developed cognitive brain regions. And so I think the kind of going back to the vintage value, I think kindness sometimes gets lost with the anonymity that we're afforded through social media in particular, and even just technology. My guys are really big video game players (laughs) and the guys that I counsel and also my sons and my husband. And that plays into it 
as well. Like you, even if you're playing with friends from across town, or in some cases, I've got kids that play with friends in Asia, you're still not connected face to face. And that sometimes, I don't know, leads you to treat people like video game characters, quite frankly. Mm. Mm. So true. And not human beings. Yes. Wow. That's so good. Mm -hmm. And I was even thinking when you were talking earlier about kindness and compassion and respect, Chinway, there has been so much happening in our country and continuing to happen that have created opportunity for us to talk more with our kids in an important and meaningful way. And you continue to be a thoughtful, trustworthy voice that we have learned so much from in this space. Would you talk some about things you want every parent to communicate or do with their kids in response to the racial division in our country? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much to the both of you for really opening up your platform last summer for this conversation. And this is where I'm just going to be as open as I know how to be. And Sissy and I Please do. connected a couple days ago because I've been in prayer and I, and I often am because this is still not natural to me, like, you know, doing, you know, podcasts and talks and, and media, I'm getting more reps but I often ask the Lord, well, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> what do you want me to mm. say? And what is this about? And I know it's not about me. It's about you and it's about your kingdom. And so I was doing that and I was taking a walk and I was praying and I was like, okay, Lord, I've got Sissy and David's podcast coming up. What do you want me to say? And of course, in light of the shooting death of another African-American mm. by law enforcement, that was like the first thing that popped in my mind. And I was like, okay, Lord, now how do you want me to convey my thoughts? And, you know, I didn't get anything immediately, to be honest with you. And then I came home, made myself a cup of coffee opened up Instagram, and I saw a message by a minister who is also a businesswoman, who's also a powerhouse. Her name is Nona, and she just posted a heartfelt message to mothers, basically sharing her fears and her concerns and her sadness and her heartbreak. And I was in tears because honestly, that's mm. what I was wrestling with. And I was like, God, I just, it feels too personal. Mm. It doesn't feel professional. It doesn't feel like what I should be doing, but is this what I should be doing? And I got confirmation. And so that is what I really want to share with parents. And maybe if we had this recording on another day, I'd be talking about something completely different. We are so grateful for you to talk about this. Yes. Thank you. I'm heartbroken. <laughs> Let me just start with that, because as counselors, that's what we ask of our clients is to tap into that emotion. And we talk a lot about emotional intelligence, and we talk a lot about resilience and connection. But it starts with recognizing what's inside of you and where you are. And I'm heartbroken. And I come to this topic as a reluctant sort of soldier mm -hmm. in this space, I'll be honest with you. I was doing a trauma workshop and I was promoting it last summer and it was just about how to work with trauma, everyday trauma, moving, divorce, separation, bullying. And then Ahmaud Arbery was murdered. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh. And then I was like, well, let me just go back to what I was doing. And then George Floyd was murdered. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very clear to me that the trauma that I needed to be talking about in this season has to do with racial trauma. And so that is the answer to your question, David, is the first thing that I would want parents to know even before they begin to lean into these really hard conversations is that racism is traumatic. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the three of us are familiar with the DSM, which is sort of our diagnostic, I've heard professors call it the Diagnostic Bible of Mental Health Disorders. So it's a classification system. We're familiar with all of the disorders that are in there. Racial trauma happens 
to not be in there. But there's Mm -hmm. been so much research anecdotally and scientifically that tells us that when people are not just experiencing direct discrimination and oppression and being made to feel that their skin color, which they have no control over, is bad or defective or wrong, over time that has an impact. And it's similar, what we're noticing now through research that's been done now for a decade, the impact is similar to what we see coming from combat veterans Mm. being hypervigilant. So all of the anxiety stuff that the three of us know so well shows up when kids and adults experience racism. And again, not just directly, but also indirectly through social media, through media, through rhetoric, just talk or imagery that leads you to believe that you're not okay as you are. And as believers, we know that that is not what God says. That's not what God says at all. We are all made in His likeness. And this is hurting. This issue is hurting kids. And because we're home, because of the pandemic, we were home a lot more and not, you know, didn't have school, at least in a building and had a lot more time. This issue has been on the forefront. And so I just want parents to know that it impacts all kids and especially kids of color when they're hearing things that make them believe that they're not okay. So true. That's the first thing, that it is a psychological issue. And Sissy and David, I don't know if you guys know this, but probably about a year ago, the American Pediatric Association, and I wish I had the statement in front of me, I don't, but they issued a statement and it was groundbreaking. They'd never done it before, pretty much saying that issues of race and discrimination and oppression are deeply negatively impactful to kids, just as anything else, you know, not having proper nutrition, not getting enough exercise, bullying, or, you know, God forbid, molesting, all of these things are bad for kids. And so is racism. Yes. Well, we sure all see evidence of it. Yes. Yes. In our offices. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Chinway, along those lines, I'm curious from a practical sense, Two things. What do you feel like parents can do? Like, what can parents be communicating? And as a white person, for any white people that are out there listening, you know, I feel like what has emerged is a lot of people are sharing amazing things on social media. And I think so often it's where it stops. Yes. It's this beautiful response. I mean, I love, I'm so inspired all the time on social media. And Mm -hmm. I want to know practically what I can do that's not in front of a hundred or a thousand people. Yes. That makes a difference. Yes. And so I would love for you to speak to both, to be teaching directly and in action, what can we be doing to help? Yes. So back to what causes pain, and then we'll talk about, you know, how to sort of combat that or undo that. It's the process of dehumanizing people, Mm. any people. Yes. And dehumanization is basically the psychological process by which other people are over time perceived as non-human. And sometimes we do that in language, sometimes, you know, calling people apes or vermin or rats or whatever, any group of people that don't look like us, don't think like us, aren't part of our group. But it really does have the potential and the power to over time justify harming other people. But they're not like us. They don't look like us. They don't live in our neighborhood. They're not a part of our community. So they're other. And so that is how, again, if I can be frank, that's how human beings can be enslaved. That's how Mm. 6 million Jewish people can be led to their slaughter, not just people, women and children. And then we know what's been happening with our Asian brothers and sisters. So I think that's important Mm. for parents to know that that's where it starts is when we don't consider our brothers and sisters human. So then the antidote or the practical takeaway from that is how can we humanize people, right? How do we humanize people? So going back to compassion, we can't have compassion unless we have 
empathy. Empathy is the first step of compassion. So being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes, even if they look completely different from you, even if they worship differently from you, even if they vote differently from you, how can you as a fellow human say that is a human, that's a human being, and that is my brother and sister. And if that is the case, how am I going to treat them? How am I going to advocate for them? How am I going to fight for rights and justice for that individual? So that's one thing. But for parents in particular, I think a practical strategy is through connection. And you guys write about this and talk about this in so many different ways. I think we as parents can send subtle but powerful messages to our kids and our teens, just the way that we interact with people who don't look like us. I think that storytelling is powerful something that the two of you do so brilliantly when I've watched your seminars and read your books. And I'm always moved. I was a school counselor for many years. And whenever I'd go up and do a guidance lesson or run a group and I would just share a personal story or a story about another kid, everybody just like draws in. I'm sure you guys have seen that happen. It's a powerful tool. So if you as a parent you know, you're not directly engaging with someone of a different background or color or culture, because just quite frankly, because I, I hear this from the parents that I counsel, there's just not a lot of diversity in your community. Have you had an interaction even from childhood that you can recount and share with your children hmm. that was positive, that was beautiful, that was transformative? I have a neighbor and we don't have much alike other than we live in the same neighborhood. We have sons that are the exact same age and we meet at the bus stop every day and we have lots of great conversations. He happens to be a white male and he's absolutely delightful. And when all of this erupted last summer, I could tell he wanted to talk about it, you know, and he wasn't quite sure how to talk about race. And, and that's such a common thing. But he, it just was on his heart. Like he, I could tell that there was a lament there that he was lamenting. And we both are Christians. I, I will say that. He brought it up and, and, and we just kind of talked about it. And then the next day he came up to me and there were tears in his eyes. And he said, you know, Chen Wei, I am 50 years old and I remember being 13 years old and I was playing on this basketball team. And I was really, really good at basketball. My parents really wanted to encourage that. And I was the only white guy on the basketball team. And he was like, and I was really nervous. I wasn't sure how I would be accepted. And he said, and, and truthfully, there were like two guys who really weren't that welcoming. He said, but the coach happened to be African-American and the rest of the team, African-American young men, really just embraced me and the coach. And I, he said, one day I was like, I'm just going to quit. And I told my parents I was going to quit. And the coach talked to me and he was like, son, we want you here. You're so good. We need you. You're a part of the team and you're a part of the family. Mm -hmm. And he told me the story, tears in his eyes. And by then, by the end of the story, he was just bawling. Mm -hmm. And then he said, it hurts me what's happening in our country. Mm. He said, I'm so grieved by it. And he goes, I don't know what to do, but I know that as a parent, I've got to do something. And I, and I really remember the kindness and the love and the compassion that was shown to me. And I was different. I was mm. different from those guys. He's like, but I always remember that warmth and that love. And I want to pass that on. Mm. Mm. I think just the stories humanize people. Yes. Stories draw people in. Stories really highlight compassion and connection. And so for parents, I think, again, if you happen to live in a community that doesn't have a lot of diversity, if you can just go back in your own history to share a story of a positive experience you've had with someone who doesn't look like you. And if you don't have those stories to share, I love stories about Jackie Robinson and Babe Ruth. And there's so many books that are right that are out there yes. that really depict the greatness and the wonder and the talent of all people from different backgrounds. So that's a couple of things that I would like to offer. Mm. 
It's so good. So good. Do you have some books that you would recommend for parents to read to kids or to share with kids? I do. There are several. For kids, I would recommend a book called I Am Enough by Grace Byers, and she's written other wonderful books, so you may be familiar with her. If you go and just pull up the cover, you're going to fall in love with this character. (laughs) She's just so beautiful. (laughs) And there's another one called God's Very Good Idea by Trilla J. Newble. For parents of kids who may feel different, they may feel different because they are in a community that doesn't have a lot of kids that look like them, or maybe they have some form of disability or they're in a wheelchair. There is a great book called Happy in Our Skin, Mm -hmm. and that's by Fran Manushkin, and I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. And just a general book about just talking about race that I would recommend. It's actually called Let's Talk About Race, and it's by Julius Lester. And finally, this is such a wonderful book. It's called Something Happened in Our Town, and it's by Marianne Solano. And that's a great, wonderful book that has a white character and a Black child character trying to figure out what happened in this town. Wow. Mm. I love Colorful, too. That's a great one. We've been reading that with Henry a lot lately. Oh, yes. We are so thrilled to be partnering with our friends at Minnow to bring back the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. We all know that devices are here to stay. So if you want to make screen time meaningful for your kids, Minnow is for you. A new streaming service designed just for kids. Minnow has over 2,000 episodes of fun and faith-filled shows that have been carefully curated by moms, dads, and church leaders so it's safe for your family. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.gominnow.com to start your free trial. Another thing that I would want parents to take away from this conversation is that it's never too late and kids are never too young. It doesn't have to be a history lesson about race and discrimination in this country. It can just be books about kids of all races, all backgrounds, having fun. So you're then just exposing your child to kids of different backgrounds. And what's interesting about my practice, and I only figured this out this past year, Sissy and David, is that I serve 50% white families, white clients, and 50% Black families and Black clients. And I just love that God has put me in this unique position. So cool. Yes, I think so too. I'm having all sorts of interesting conversations. And what my white families often say to me, because they know that there's like an open floor to talk about hard things, including, you know, racism. What my white families often say is, Chinue, we really want to be a part of the solution. We really want to be a part of change. And so how do we do it? We don't want to say anything wrong. We don't want to get it wrong in any way. And then some families will actually say, you know, we think our kids are still so young and too innocent for us to have these conversations. And so I think that's a predominant belief among many, many white families. And to that, I would just say this. I know that you're worried about protecting your kids and that's important, but I really think it's important to also consider that this conversation has so many benefits, including building intimacy, building trust. So you as the leader in your household, and I strongly believe that parents, that we are leaders, you want to be a trusted authority. You want to be a trusted voice. And that means that, you know, we have to talk about hard slash uncomfortable, even taboo. I don't think race is a taboo topic, But for some families, it feels that way. So I think it's important just to remember that when you can engage your kids in these conversations, especially early, as early as four and five years old, it's helping to 
enhance your kid's sense of resilience. It's helping to build empathy. It's helping to have your child be a better friend, really. They have like much more of an understanding about right and wrong and justice and people's pain and suffering and it builds compassion. So that's what I would offer my white families who are a bit nervous talking about race at such an early age. I'm so glad for you to say that. And I don't know that you and I have ever talked about this, but I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas. And I went to Central High School for a year and then ended up transferring to another school, but where the integration, where all of that went so haywire in Arkansas. And I mean, I wasn't there at the time. I'm younger than that. Yes, you are. But (laughs) there was an incredible amount of racial tension at Central High School still. And I think just Little Rock. I mean, I loved where I grew up. But I have to say, I feel so nervous talking about it. And I I do think that's so often what stops us from stepping in. And I have been thinking about it so much like grief Mm -hmm. and how I feel like with grief, we do the same thing where we think I'm going to say the wrong thing. I don't want to bring this up for someone, especially if it's not an issue for them right now. And I think I can feel my self-consciousness so often and knowing that I don't ever want to say something that would offend someone ever. And so in my life as a person, I think I default to not saying anything rather than offending someone. Mm -hmm. And so I think you would say it's like grief. And anybody who would say when they've Mm -hmm. lost someone, just say something. It doesn't matter if you're saying, hey, help me know how to verbalize this, but still just say something. Does that feel true? Any words you would say to that? Oh, gosh. That feels spot on. And Sissy, I'm so glad you said that because I think that's the case for so many people. I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina, which I haven't checked recently, but I feel like it's still 99% white. (laughs) (laughs) And I went to a Catholic school that was 99% white. So I've been socialized around people of different races. My father is a French professor. He worked at the College of Charleston for like 100 years. He retired a few years ago. So I've been socialized around other cultures, other people from different backgrounds. So I always say, for me, it's easy it's not always easy. This week has been hard. Sometimes it's emotional. Sometimes I need a moment. But for people who want to engage in the conversations, I'm ready because I've had reps. I've had practice Mm. doing it. And I have a comfort and a familiarity around white people and Asian people because that was my upbringing. But I can absolutely understand that for So many people, especially if you've grown up in an environment where there's racial tension or you were taught like so many that we don't talk about this or that God loves everybody equally. Right. We don't see race. Yes. So we just keep silent. I can understand that. And I've had friends tell me the exact same thing. But you hit the nail right on the head, sissy. It's like grief. It's like when people are hurting, it's hard to know what to say. Mm -hmm. It's hard to know how to connect but you recognize it. And we know through neuroscience research, which I know the three of us are big, huge fans of, it's informed my counseling and changed it and transformed it a thousand percent. There are things called mirror neurons. So when you sit with people, you can tell that people are in distress by their vocal tone, by the look on their face, their eyes, their posture even, right? And so we feel that. We can feel those cues when we sit with people in therapy that they're hurting. But by the way, as humans, we have that ability. And so when people are hurting, even if you don't fully understand it, even if you don't agree with it, which is a whole nother conversation, Mm -hmm. but when people say they're hurting, you have to lean in. And yes, you're not going to find the exact right words and the words aren't going to come out perfectly. And even for me, I live in the world of trauma and grief. And sometimes I'm like, Lord, when I'm sitting with a client, I'm like, Lord, what do I say? But it's not always about what you say. It's about oftentimes what you do. And if you do reach out, even via text, and I've gotten messages, I've gotten messages from you, Sissy, via DMs on Instagram, just saying, I'm thinking about you. I know you did this hard thing and my heart hurts for you. 
I love you. I care about you. I'm sorry for your hurt. I have friends from the Asian American community and what we know happened here in Atlanta just a few weeks ago was so devastating. And I've talked to them and I've asked them what's been helpful. And they said, you know, people don't fully know or understand or know all the details of this. None of that stuff matters. All that matters is that human to human connection when someone else, another one of God's children is hurting, you connect and just say, I see you and I love you. And that is enough. That is enough. I just keep saying in my head, yes, I yes, know, me yes, too. yes, yes, yes. Me too. And you need to be very careful saying a whole other conversation around the two of us because we'd like to have a hundred other conversations <laughs> yes, we with you. Yes. We keep you on all day. I would love it. I'd love to ask you, Another question, if we could, you talked about your kids a few minutes ago, mentioned them, and would love if you would just tell us a little bit about your kids and something, Chenwei, that you would say they are teaching you in this season. Oh my gosh. Well, can I just say that I guess they're teaching me about patience, but I had a whole lot more patience before I became a parent. <laughs> I've got to tell you, I know I know parenting <laughs> teaches you about patience, but I don't know that you really gain more patience. I don't know. I have three beautiful souls that the Lord allows me to care for. So I have Jalen, who is my 17-year-old bonus daughter. She did not come from my loins, <laughs> but she's mine just the same. Uh, yes, she's with us probably every other week. And she's a senior and she loves art. She's really into animation and she's super smart. She's absolutely lovely, so sweet. And then I have Brayden, who is my nine-year-old, and he is on the autism spectrum. And David, you just talked about a whole nother conversation. That's a whole nother conversation. Mm. Yes. Sign us up. We would love to do that. <laughs> yes, we would. God has been really working on me and my husband around the processing of that journey. But it took me a couple of years, and I like to share I'm pretty much an open book, but I got to tell you, when we got that diagnosis, when he was three years old, it took me a couple of years to share. And I had people wanting me to blog and talk about it and do seminars. I was like, I'm not ready yet, mm. but we have come a long way. He is brilliant. He is kind hearted. He is thoughtful. If you ever follow me on Instagram, you know that he does not love taking pictures. <laughs> <laughs> So he's the one that's sort of making a face or like, okay, mommy, you said one more. You said one more. But he's so awesome. And then Noah, who's six, and he is in kindergarten, and he is my rambunctious, considerate, amazing, loving, affectionate kid. And what they've been teaching me, especially in this season, is how to let things go. Hmm. Basically, what we know about most kids, especially in the early ages and stages, this has been my experience. I don't know if you guys would agree with this. Kids are really good about letting things go. If we as parents upset them or get on their nerves or even offer a consequence, they're going to be mad in the moment. But that very next day, it's like it didn't happen. Teenagers, that's a little different, but <laughs> <laughs> but the little ones, they just hug you and love you. And they're like, that's done. That's mm. done. That was yesterday. And even with their friends mm. on the playground or the soccer field, my kid plays soccer, they get into a tiff with their buddy and five minutes later, they're over it and they're loving each other. And I see that in my kids. I'll wake up in the morning after one of them had a consequence. And I'm thinking, okay, Lord, let me let them know that that was yesterday and today's a new day and we're starting over and they're doing it. Like, I don't even have to do anything. They wake up, we love you, mommy. And you know, what's for breakfast? And today's a whole new day. I think that there's so many takeaways from that, just depending on where you are in your life and the stage you are in terms of parenting, offer yourself a lot of compassion especially now, especially with the stress of the change and the new normal and all the transitions that we've experienced, let things go. Let things go. Every day, the Lord offers us a fresh new anointing. 
Every day is a brand new day to just do the very best that you can. Maya Angelou, I believe, said, when you don't know better, you kind of do what you do. But when you know better, Mm. you do better, right? And so every single day we're learning and we're trying to do better. And that's what my kids teach me, that I don't have to hold on to something. If I made a parenting mistake, if I lost my temper. I love that. Okay, Chimway, so if you had to kind of back up and get big picture, what would you say are two or three of your guiding principles as a parent? Maybe it's dancing because you were dancing in the background. That was fun. (laughs) Dance parties. Yeah, dancing because I'm a big fan of fun. So here's the odd thing. Maybe you guys get this too, but I live in the world of trauma, grief, and pain, but I like to laugh and I like to have fun. And in my sessions, I always point my clients towards hope, right? There's always hope. So that's who I am. I'm a glass half full type of person. So I have a ton of optimism. And that's really what I think is one of my guiding principles as a parent. We have to have fun. Do you guys remember that old school saying something to the effect of, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Yes, yes. yes. But that's a guiding principle for me. It's like no matter what's going on, global pandemic, you know, stress. We lost our my mother in law last year. Um, there are tons oh, of loss. Sorry. Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry for you to lost your grandmother, sissy. Right, not oh, too long ago. Thank you, Jimmy. So yeah, blessings to you and your family. You know, loss is hard. Life is hard. But if we're on this side of heaven. It's a blessing and we have to enjoy every single moment. So that's a guiding principle for me is cherish each moment, inject fun as often as you can, and you don't have to spend a whole lot of money to do it. Mm. So that's it. Cherish every moment, inject fun wherever you can. And what my kids have taught me is a guiding principle that every day offers a fresh new anointing. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we can always start over. We can Mm -hmm. always push the reset button. And we shouldn't beat ourselves up as parents because we're thinking about it. They're not thinking about it. Mm -hmm. They just want to be loved and loved some more. Mm -hmm. Everyone listening who had not yet had an opportunity to discover this amazing human being is now understanding why we said all the things we said on the front side of this podcast and how excited we have been to have your voice as a part of this time. And I just am listening and learning as I feel like I do every time I intersect with you. As always, you have such a thoughtful voice and things almost fell perfectly in place recently. We were in Atlanta (sighs) doing a filming. We were so excited we were going to be near you and we had (laughs) dreamed about We'd already talked about the uh, restaurant we, we were going had, to. We wanted you. to go to one of our favorite places, <laughs> Super Rica, with one of our favorite new people, you. And we just had been talking about we were so excited. And then we discovered you were traveling in that time. Speaking. It was just too good to be true. But we're going to mm-hmm. hold on to the hope that that's going to still happen at some point in your city or our city. And when it does, we'd love to know what kind of taco are you going to order when we get to share that dream meal together. <laughs> So yes, I was really looking forward to it. I was like, can we talk about race? That's fine, but let's talk about tacos. <laughs> <laughs> so I have like two that are my favorites. So, and I think it sort of speaks to like different sides or both sides of my personality. So I love shrimp tacos yes. from like a nice restaurant. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm a fan of shrimp tacos with the coleslaw and all the things. Mm-hmm. And, um, sometimes like they have like cilantro yes. sauce or something that goes mm-hmm. with it. It's so yummy. And so that's like a soft shell taco, right? But honestly, I was at Taco Bell (laughs) yesterday with my kids and I got like the Dorito taco for the very first time. My mouth is watering still. Really? I've never had that. So we got to go. Wow. (gasps) So good. When's the last time you've been to Taco Bell? It's been a little (laughs) bit. But we love Taco Bell. If any Taco Bell execs are listening, we like Taco Bell. Right? Sponsorship. Yes. <laughs> so it was it was so surprisingly delicious. So there you go. Those are my two favorites. That is awesome. Chimway, so we feel confident that every person who listens to this podcast is going to want to find you. I learn from your Instagram daily. 
and just glean great truth all the time. Where are the best places for them to find you and get to learn more about what you're doing? I think I'm probably on all of the accounts, but the one that I'm primarily on is Instagram and it's dr. Period Chinway Williams and that's C-H-I-N-W-E-W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S. I do have a website, MeaningfulSolutionsCounseling.com. Again, MeaningfulSolutionsCounseling.com. And we're waiting for your first book. We can't wait. Oh, can I mention it? Can I mention yes, it? Yes, you can. Okay, please I didn't do. know that was real. Oh my goodness, Chimway, please. It's real. <laughs> Tell us. It's real. I would love to come back yes. with my writing partner to talk about it. His name is Will Hutcherson, and he is a youth pastor out of Florida. He's an amazing wow. human being. And we are writing a book about how to heal despair in kids and teens. And oh. that's a book for parents and also ministry leaders and really anybody who loves young people but feels completely helpless in how to help because let's face it, you guys know this, you're jam-packed full, I'm jam-packed full, and counselors right now are full yeah. and we just want to equip parents and leaders and people who love kids and teens with strategies on how to connect with young people who are experiencing despair. So oh. that's coming out in August. Wow. We're super excited about it. Okay. Tell us the title. Where can they find it? The working title, it's Seen mm. Healing Despair in Kids and Teens wow. Through Connection. We're so excited to get a copy of it. We put us on the list. Oh, you're going to be first on the list. Okay. <laughs> I truly glean so much from both of you as a clinician, as a mom, as a believer. I'm just so drawn to your work and your written work and every time you open up your mouth. And Sissy, I've told you this, my clients fan out <laughs> when they see you say anything about a post that I've done. Or if I like a post, they're like, you know Sissy God? Do you know David? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so fun. But it's not fandom for the sake of fandom. Ooh. It's based and rooted in the genuineness and the richness of the content that you guys provide to parents and leaders. So I just want to say thank you. Mm. And I am a fan. Well, right back at right you. Right back at you. It is very mutual. And we're just so grateful for your friendship. It really has been such a sweet part of this last year and a half for us. So we're just really grateful for you. And thank you for sharing all of the truth that you have with us today. Can't wait to have shrimp or Dorita tacos with you soon. (laughs) Yes. Thank you, friend. Thank you. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow helps you make screen time meaningful for your family, which shows kids love and values parents' trust. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.g-o-m-i-n-n-o. It's our joy to bring the experience and insight we gain through our work beyond the walls of the Daystar House. Join us next time for more help and hope as you continue your journey of raising boys and girls.